It is great to be here, and if I can start with something that Lindsay said uh, just a few moments ago, and she reminded us all to be present. Like all of you in this room, I'm constantly trying to better myself in every way, and I'll admit I'm not great at it. Uh, you know, I'll, it's an ongoing process. I don't do really, really well in everything, but like you, I'm always trying to refine my diet. I'm always trying to refine, refine my workouts. And two of the things that I'm working on right now are being present and living in gratitude. So if I may, let me start by saying I am so grateful that this organization exists to be introduced to this community. Uh, I am so grateful to be able to speak with you, to be able to learn from you, uh, and I am so grateful for the opportunity to collaborate with as many of you as is possible. Uh, and that's something that uh, Dan and Cody mentioned just a minute ago, collaboration. This time in which we live, the, the speed of transformation in business is so fast that it's impossible for organizations, Fortune 50 organizations and small companies like mine and individual operators like some of you, it's impossible to grow from the inside out anymore. You have to grow from the outside in. I was at a conference recently that included some of the main thought leaders in the world in healthcare and technology. I had the honor of interviewing Deepak Chopra, Sanjay Gupta, the CEO of Johnson & Johnson, the CEO of Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, the CEO of Nestle Company, the CEO of PepsiCo, uh, on and on and on. They came to collaborate. This is a conference nobody knows about because it's not about making noise. It's about people coming together and saying, this is what I'm working on. What do you think? I can't do it alone. I need your technology piece. I need your business expertise. Uh, I need you guys to help me. I want to help you. So I just want to reemphasize what the guys said about collaborating throughout the weekend. Uh, let me go back. I didn't know I'd push that. This is our business, Growing Boulder. Uh, our business mission is nothing short of rebranding aging, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, aging needs to be rebranded uh, in every way and in uh, every conceivable way possible. And I want to talk to you about how we're doing that. And I also hope that I can inspire and motivate you. That's, that's my mission today. I will share with you as much as I can about what we're doing, what's working, what's not working. But hopefully I can motivate and inspire you. And I know that's a tough task because this is a group of highly inspired and highly motivated people. But that's what we're all about. So I want to ask you to start by just imagining either an 80 or a 90-year-old woman. And if you imagine somebody that is a rotting corpse six feet underground, that's fair, because the average life expectancy in the U.S. today is 79 years old. It's about 81.5 for a white woman, a little bit higher for a Hispanic woman, a little bit less for an African-American woman, but it's 79.5 is the average life expectancy. So how you imagine an 80 or 90-year-old woman to a large degree is going to determine how you age. And I'll prove that to you coming up here in a minute. So did you imagine the woman on top who is 80? Or did you imagine the woman on the bottom who is 90? That's Joanna Quass. She's a German woman. She's the world's oldest competitive gymnast. She here is not only showing you how she works on the parallel bars, but she's giving you a nice smile and posing while she does it. She's an animal on the floor X. Uh, she can work the pommel horse. She can do it all at 90 years old. As opposed to life expectancy, the definition of lifespan is the age of the oldest individual in any particular species. And for human beings, this is it, 122 years, 164 days. That's how long Madame Jean Calme, a French woman, lived before she died in 1997. Jean took up fencing at 85. She rode her bike every day until she was 100. She lived alone until she was 110. The oldest living human in the world today is a 116-year-old, an Italian woman, who took over when another 116-year-old woman from America died, who took over from an another American woman who died at 116. It's difficult to get beyond 116. So how long will we live? We are at the beginning of a longevity revolution, irrespective of what the average life expectancy is. This is what Prudential says. Prudential's bought billboards to try to tell you that the first person to live to be 150 is alive today. They have a vested interest. They want to sell you insurance. 
Because how in the heck can you afford to live to be 150 years old? Unless you think this is just a company that wants to make some money off of you, consider that a guy by the name of Aubrey de Grey, who is a biomedical gerontologist who works for Cambridge University in the UK, he believes seriously that the first person to live to be 1,000 is alive today. I've interviewed Aubrey de Grey several times. He's not a wacko. Many people think he is a wacko. Aubrey believes that death is pretty much a disease. It's the byproduct of toxins from cellular multiplication. And at some point, the toxins become so severe that we die. He believes that technologies exist today that will enable us through generic therapies to extend lifespan 30 years. And in that 30 years, new genetic technologies will be developed that will then extend lifespan another 30 years. And in that 30 years, new technologies will be developed that will extend and so on and so forth to when we achieve something that he calls escape velocity. We have escaped death. We will continue to live forever, according to Aubrey de Grey. Unless you think that he is just some academic wacko, if you've heard of a company called Calico, it's a Google company. It's not a secret company, but nobody knows about it because they don't talk about it. Google's got crazy money. Google has moonshot money. They get people together and say, let's try to figure out something we could do, where if we do it, because nobody else can, we can make a zillion dollars. How about we cure death? They're working on it right now. Unless you think it's just Google that's doing it, there's the Palo Alto Longevity Prize, which is fairly popular now uh, in Silicon Valley and subscribed to by nearly every CEO in Silicon Valley where they've offered a million dollar prize for the first individual, the first research team, the first company that can extend lifespan beyond 30 years. There are people that are working on this. To me, it's a dystopian future. I think it will be a nightmare. Here's what we know for sure. This is the U.S. Census information. In 30 years, there will be as many people over 80 as there are under five. That's never happened before in the history of humankind. For my money, I like what Honest Abe Lincoln says. In the end, it's not the years in your life that counts, it's the life in your years. That's the business you people are in. You're in the business of adding life to the years of people. And here's what we know as well. There's a new life stage that has never before existed in the history of humankind. And it's why you guys are here today. For the first time in history, if you make the right lifestyle choices, you have the very real expectation of living two, three, even four decades beyond what has been considered normal retirement age. Your post-retirement years can be longer than the years that you spend in your career. What are you going to do with it? This is, this is how you sell. This is how you attract clients. This is what resonates. Nobody wants to think that everything is in their rearview mirror. It is never too late. Anything is possible, and it really is. That's how I'm building my business, by sharing the examples of ordinary people living extraordinary lives. When we can see ourselves and others, that's when the magic occurs. We don't look for genetic super freaks. They're out there. Interesting to look at. Fun to listen to. Doesn't inspire anybody. When you can find a 90-year-old woman that never did anything until she was 85 and then hooked up with a personal trainer who helped her turn her life around and now she's traveling the world competing in master sports, you've got my attention and I think you've got everybody else's. I want to show you a video now. Um, I swam in the Rowdy Gaines, I swim in the Rowdy Gaines Masters Classic every year because Rowdy's a friend. Rowdy is a three-time Olympic gold medalist. He was just named one of the 30 most influential swimmers, in, uh, influential people in the history of swimming. He will do his seventh Olympics for NBC in Rio this year. He's also the fastest over 50 swimmer alive. And he has a meet every year. It's the Rowdy Gaines Masters Classic. I go and I swim in it, and I always take a camera with me because there's a zillion stories. Everybody there's got a story. So I always do a story. This was the story that I did uh, this year. These are four friends from Jacksonville who piled into their car one day, drove to Orlando to swim in a swim meet, and this is what happened. The Rowdy Gaines Masters Classic, already known for fast times and world record-setting swims, 
is about to witness something extra special. Because we're going to try to set a world's record in the 800 meter freestyle relay. I don't know whether we'll finish or not, but we'll try. For the first time since the international governing body of swimming began recognizing world records in the 400 and 800 meter freestyle relays, a team will compete in the 360 plus age group. Their ages? 93, 92, 90, and 89. I don't want to put any pressure on you, but you're a part of history right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd love to joke about it, but it's really true. Nothing like this has ever been done in our sport in the history of our sport. This is the first time. I am so proud of you, and I'm so honored to be able to be in your presence. I really am. I am absolutely panicked. <laughs> After all these years, I can't create any nervousness. I'd like to get nervous, so. Would you like to? I'd like to again. <laughs> It'd be a real kick. Before they go for the record, we had to ask. Have you got any ailments? Is there anything wrong with you? Everything you can imagine. Oh, <laughs> you don't have enough film in that thing. I have uh, peripheral neuropathy in my, in my legs, so I get cramps. But I've had heart bypass. Macular degeneration, <laughs> which keeps me from being able to see. Motor cuff operation. I ruptured a, a tendon. I fell down the steps. I've had heart repair besides my bypass. I'm suffering from uh, temporal arthritis right now. I got a pacemaker. Aortic valve transplant. I've had a hip replaced. I've had a knee replaced. There isn't anything left really for him to work on. So why does he continue to swim at the age of 93? It got me to 93. My uh, doctor told me if I hadn't swum I'd been dead 10 years ago. So I keep at it. Realizing the importance of swimming to his health and well-being, Tiger recruited the other swimmers who got back in the water after decades and now hold one another accountable for showing up to practice. We're going to be cheering you on. Uh, so you recruited these guys, and in a, in a sense, they're keeping you alive. That's right. I owe them everything. I'm not going to pay them anything, but I owe them everything. 93-year-old Tiger Holmes is the leadoff man. Tiger dives in and almost immediately turns onto his back, which is legal in the freestyle. Each relay member will swim 200 meters, or eight lengths of the 25-meter pool. As his teammates anxiously await their turn, Tiger finishes strongly, giving way to Bill Adams, a retired law professor who swam for Duke decades ago. Now, I would ask you how that felt, but you're always going to tell me it felt like Yeah. <laughs> you're right, buddy. Adams powers his way through his laps, giving way to Edwin Graves, a former Georgia Tech swimmer. Okay. The anchor man is 90-year-old John Course, an attorney who still practices law. Ed takes a seat beside Tiger and Bill while John sprints home, officially setting a new world record. Awesome. Way to go. Awesome. While swimming's new international heroes pose for photos, the meet's host, three-time Olympic gold medalist Rowdy Gaines, is nearly brought to tears. I learned how to swim when I was nine months old. Um, and I've never had an experience like that before in my life. It, it was, uh, I guess it brings me back to my grandfather and, you know, thinking what a hero he was to me. And, and uh, they'll be gone soon. And uh, it, it means a lot. It really does. I don't know why. I mean, it, it took 20 minutes to do it. But um, it means a lot to me. It really does. Apparently, it doesn't mean quite as much to the team. To be honest with you, it's a matter of uh, mathematical probability. And the probability is, it has nothing to do with our swimming ability. What it has to do is with putting together four people in a, an age group like ours, and that's a very difficult thing for anybody to do. And they weren't through doing it. They swam two more relays together, setting records in both, 
a performance that earned them the Growing Boulder Inspiration Award given for the first time without a vote of the complete committee. And I went to Mark and I said, forget the committee, this is what we have to do. And he looked at me and he goes, absolutely, it's a slam dunk. It's an amazing performance that sends ripples worldwide because they came not just to swim. They came to have a good time with their friends to demonstrate that it's possible for all of us to live a life filled with love, laughter, and world records, even into our 90s. Whatever you do, do it well and hard. Go at it 100%. Yeah, aren't they something? To me, the moral of that story is these are guys who just refuse to get captured by the couch. Uh, they have the same ailments that, that everybody is going to get or has. And, and the problem is uh, the couch has momentum. The couch has inertia. Uh, I don't believe in maintenance. Um, I don't think we're maintaining. Uh, I think we're either getting better or we're getting worse. Uh, and for all of us, it's happening very slowly, one direction or another, until the very end. You know, we can't face it. We are mortal beings. There's a period when we're going to get frail, and we want to compress that as much as we can, and then we're going to die. But up until that, we can continue to get better. Don't have to do it overnight. Uh, but you've got to, and I think we all know, am I getting better right now, or am I getting worse? Uh, most people give up. Uh, they have any one of the three things that all these guys had, and that puts them back on the couch, and that is the beginning of the end. They just refused to give up. Uh, your market is growing not only in number, but it is expanding by decades. I mean, you guys are at the right place at the right time in the right business. Uh, 10,000 people are turning 65 each and every day. That is a huge number. And when you put that together with the fact that we now have role models like we just saw, that let people know that ordinary people can live amazing lives if they get with it, uh, it it's going to be incredible. Uh, the guy on the, on the left, by the way, is Ray Clark. He is nine, he's 102. He started working out when he was 98 when his wife died. Uh, his trainer, by the way, is 70. Uh, on, the, on the right, this is from Phoenix. Maybe you guys know this. This is Anton Yoga. There's something in Phoenix called Anton Yoga. That's Anton. Uh, and this is Edna, who's 98 years old. And Anton creates, has created a bunch of viral videos with Edna just because she's adorable. Look at her. You know, we got pictures of Edna pumping iron, Edna doing all kinds of stuff. That's what everybody in your business needs. That's what gets people's attention. That's what draws people. Other 98-year-old women, men see Edna doing their thing and Anton's helping her. I want to go back to Marie Calment. This is my favorite story about Marie. This is the woman I showed you early, 122 years, 164 days, the woman that defines human lifespan. When Edna was 90 years old, she entered into a deal with a 47-year-old attorney. The contract was that he would pay her the equivalent of 500 U.S. dollars, about 2,500 French francs a month until she died. And then he got her place, a gorgeous second-story apartment in the south of France. The guy, no doubt, thought he had made the deal of a lifetime. <laughs> 90 years old, 500 bucks a month. When she dies, it's mine. 30 years later, when he died, <laughs> at the age of 77, Jean was 120. He had paid the equivalent of over $200,000 for an apartment that was worth about $80,000, and he'd never lived in it in a day. And the obligation to pay Jean shifted to his widow. She continued to pay Jean three more years until Jean died at 122, and by that time, the woman was in a nursing home, and she never lived in the home uh, at all. No moral to that story? Uh, <laughs> just an interesting story. Was Jean a genetic super freak? No. Uh, I, I, one of her siblings lived to 90. She definitely had longevity in her genetic code. But this is something you all know, because it's everywhere these days. Active longevity is determined only 25% by genes and 75% by lifestyle. And the thing about genes is that you may be genetically predisposed to have anything. Cardiac issues, breast cancer, 
how you live your life, the lifestyle choices that you make to a large degree determine whether those genes express themselves or not. Lifestyle is the big one. This is uh, Ernestine Shepard. We've had her on the radio show three or four times. Uh, we don't show a lot of this uh, because, from Ernestine because people look at that and say, well, that's not possible. She's, you know, but she's all natural. She never did anything until she was... I think she was in her, I think she was 68 or 70, never lifted a weight. Started lifting weight in her late 60s, early 70s. Once you start exercising, honey, it's a whole new ball game. This is what we do on Facebook. Uh, we, we produce two radio shows. We produce a radio show. We publish a magazine. We've got a bunch of websites. We put all of our content on Facebook, but we also do this. We create shareable stuff that inspire people if we just put this picture up there, people would be interested in it. When you put a message like that, once you start exercising, honey, it's a whole new ball game. I'll show you our Facebook numbers in a minute, and you'll see why it resonates. There was a major study at the National Senior Games this past year in Minneapolis. Um, it was a survey. It was a survey that was developed in Norway. It was a very elaborate survey where they asked all of the people who entered, 5,000 people entered, only 35, 3,800 came to compete, but all 5,000 took part in the survey. And the survey was asking a series of questions, a long survey, to determine what they called fitness age. The average fitness age of the people who competed in the National Senior Games was 43, despite the fact that their chronological age was 68. The fitness age of the people that competed in the National Senior Games was 25 years younger than their actual age. And that's important because it turns out that fitness age is a more accurate indicator of how many years you have left than is chronological age. This is Olga Kotelko. Olga Kotelko never did anything. You know, she lived a tough life like many people of her generation, raised a family, had kids. Finally, when her husband died, she decided she wanted to do something. Uh, she got herself a trainer. She got herself a coach. All of these people I'm showing you, none of, them do, none of them do this on their own. They have someone that inspires them, that motivates them. Olga got a trainer, and the next thing you knew, she decided she wanted to start running. Olga became an international icon. Between 90 and 94, that's an age group in master's track and field, she set 38 world records. Olga owned them all. Javelin, shot put, high jump, long jump, 100 meters. She did every single thing. Traveled the world. She competed in the world championships, said goodbye to her friends, I'm going to see you in a meet in two months, flew out of town, a week later went to bed and never got up. Olga Kotelko is the poster girl for compressed morbidity. Compressed morbidity is no longer a theory. It was for a while. It's a fact. I talked to many, many people about that. The notion of compressed morbidity is that... Uh, if you stay active, you can compress the period of disease, disability, and dysfunction that we will all suffer toward the end of our lives. Olga Kotelko maybe, maybe suffered it for a minute or two. Uh, we see this all the time. Now, if you stay active, does it necessarily increase the length of your life? Probably. Uh, but, but, but here's a life, life chart for most of us. At about 50, 55, we start doing this. It is a long, slow, gradual decline of disease, disability, and, and, and whatever else. People that compress their morbidity go like this. When they have a terminal event, they crash, and typically they crash overnight or the next night. Sign me up for compressed morbidity. Um, you can sell compressed morbidity. That's one of the real benefits of this. We may not get extra years, but if we get more quality in our years, that's the best trade-off that anybody could have. I get hung up on words, and I don't know why. It's just something I've done lately. I hate that words... If you could come up with a, with a, with a better word than seniors, you'll make a million dollars. And I can tell you that major corporations and focus groups have come... Nobody knows what to call it. Are we seniors? Are we geezers? Are we oldsters? Are we third-agers? Are we... Uh, adult essence? Are we masters? Are we silver surfers? Um, geriatric, you know, the root word is, is a Greek word, geri, which just means old. It, it was not a, a pejorative at all uh, years ago. It's only had this connection with 
negative thought in recent years. So we, we trademark the word geriatric. We use it in retirement communities. We convince people, become a geriatric. You don't have to compete in anything. Get off the freaking couch and come walk with us. And you are now a geriatric. Uh, we started Team Growing Boulder. We partnered with Track Shack, which is a company in Florida, which is one of the nation's largest events companies. They stage race, they do the Disney Marathon in LA, the Disney Marathon in Orlando. They do the Peachtree Road Race in Atlanta. They do the Chicago Marathon. It's a, it's a big company. We went to them and said, we can increase the number of people that compete in your older age groups. Just allow us. It's not going to cost you anything. Just allow us to bring in a sponsor in a category that you currently don't have to be a sponsor of Team Growing Boulder. So then we got Team Growing Boulder presented by Morgan Stanley. Um, and, and that's all we do. We, 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 we've done one race. We just started this. We're doing another one soon, but we got bunches of old people, and we put them together, and they entered a 10K that had a two-mile fun run walk. And we walked with them. We got them together. We gave them a pep talk, and we walked with them for two miles. And these are people that never in their lives would have ever considered participating in an event, in a road race, it's just like that swim meet we saw. This is the intergenerational stuff that, 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 that we need. It inspires the older people, and it inspires the younger people equally. Uh, so this is one thing that we've done. We're, we're continuing to build Team Growing Boulder. We now create weekly podcasts using the coaches, the trainers, from Track Shack, everything you need to know. A little 45-second video podcast. Uh, here's, here's how you get your shoes. Here's how you get started. Here's how you do Jeff Galloway's Run Walk program. Here's how you on and on and on and on. It's one of the benefits of membership. It's free. We need to keep moving because we are genetically hardwired to move. For 95% of human history, we were hunter-gatherers. We basically followed around packs of animals, and we foraged for nuts and vines. We have changed our diet more in the last 50 years than in the previous 10,000 years. We're not made to sit down. The CDC, I made this slide, what day did I have to have this slide show here? Tuesday? I made this sl slide Tuesday. The CDC released this Tuesday, 40%. It's supposed to be a percent there. I apologize. Over 40% of U.S. women and 35% of U.S. men are obese. That's amazing. That is an amazing number. We do these kind of things. This is, this, people ask what resonates when you put something on Facebook. We go after people. This is Krista Henderson. Hendrickson? Uh, I may have misspelled it. In any event, we saw this uh, picture. We ran her down. We said, can we use it? And she wondered, are you going to make fun of me? And we said, no, we're not going to make fun of you. We're going to inspire you. She's a plus-size uh, athlete and a personal trainer. Uh, so we did a whole series of photos with Krista Henderson. These photos were shared 400,000 times. People need to see this kind of stuff. So we talk about active longevity. The most important determinant of active longevity is neither diet nor exercise. And that's pretty much what we've been talking about. But neither one of those is the most important. And I know you guys know where I'm going with this. The most important determinant of active longevity is here. What the mind believes, the body embraces. And that's not me saying that. That's the result of numerous studies, all of which reinforce each other. Make no mistake about it. You have been brainwashed, just as Derek Zoolander was brainwashed by Magatu to kill the prime minister dude. You have been brainwashed. We have all been, especially people my age and a little bit older. We grew up with picture books. We grew up being read to. Now, these are not actual titles. I came up with these titles on my own. <laughs> but the information inside is exactly the same. There were 35 studies that were done in the 60s and 70s, when many of us grew up, about children's literature. Older characters almost didn't exist. And if they did exist, they were either non-consequential or Grandpa's going to have a heart attack and die. 
or old people are wrinkled, short, dirty, ugly, and unhealthy, or old people are useless. And it's not just children's literature. It's, it's, it's our modern media. We had Jane Seymour. We interviewed Jane Seymour for our TV show and a radio show recently. I love this woman. I hate the fact that she's endorsing crepe erase. Now they want us all to worry about crepey skin. You know, when you get old, you get wrinkled. We need to learn how to embrace this. You know, yes, we should all try to be the best we can, but, you know, it's, it's ageist to think that there's something wrong with getting older. <laughs> The new way to transform your aging skin, and right below that in the same ad, be happy in your own skin. <laughs> Anti-aging. It's crazy. Ageism on TV uh, is the worst. In 1993, 1.9% of all of the characters on primetime TV were over the age of 65. 1.9% in 1993. It's when we're growing up watching TV. And once again, if they were on TV, they were there for comic relief or to make fun of. This is one of my favorite studies. It's actually Yale and Cal Berkeley uh, duplicated a study that had been done just prior to that. It was a study that involved a group of 81, 82-year-olds, sedentary adults. And the first study took a baseline fitness test. I'm not sure what all they tested, VO2 max. Uh, a, a bunch of other stuff. They worked them out daily for six months. Uh, at the end of six months, they tested them again to see how much they improved from working out daily. And it was pretty impressive. Well, then Cal and Yale come along, and they do the same study, same kind of group of people, uh, sedentary adults. They do no physical activity at all. They do a baseline test. They do no physical activity at all. But for six months, they are subjected to positive, vital images of aging, sexy, vibrant, powerful, passionate, engaged people for six months, covert and subliminal. They see it all. At the end of six months, they tested them, and then they compared the results. And at the end of six months, the group that did no physical activity at all, but was exposed to positive images of aging, had more physical improvement than the group that worked out every single day, but was not exposed to any positive images at all. What the mind believes, the body embraces. Positive images of aging improve physical abilities more than six months of exercise, and conversely, negative age stereotypes lead to poor physical function. So this is what we, it's not just with your clients, it's with yourself. And this is why I said off the top, close your eyes and imagine an 80-year-old woman or a 90-year-old woman. To a large degree, what you imagine you will become. And you will be reinforced in that image by the media, by your family, by your friends. It's impossible to totally ignore it, but you have to try to ignore it. So that's why we've created Growing Boulder, to try to rebrand aging, to try to share the stories of ordinary people that are living extraordinary lives. Uh, I wrote a book. Uh, it's called Rock Stars of Aging. Uh, and I say right up front that this is not based upon any academic research. It's not based upon the opinion of any experts. It is solely based upon actual interviews that we have done with active centenarians, and I wager that we've done more interviews with active centenarians than any media group in the world, probably more than anybody other than the New England Centenarian Society. And we learned some interesting things, because we always ask them, you know, we ask them the same kind of questions. What's responsible? You know, what's the takeaway? What's the moral of your story? On and on and on. Every centenarian, active centenarians, differ in every way imaginable, and that's good news. You don't have to be a wealthy person. You don't have to be a white person. You don't have to be someone that you can be anything. They're all colors, all, all, all kinds. They differ in every way imaginable. Most of them don't have much money, I'll tell you that. Most of them have very little money and lead very frugal lives. But they do share some common traits. And here's number one. They are chill. They are. They do not worry about anything. Are you afraid to die? What's there to be afraid of? Are you afraid you're going to run out of money? What's there to be afraid of? 
They do not worry about anything. They have a passion for life. I can tell you beyond a certain age, unhappy people just die. They don't exist. Now, I'm talking about active centenarians. Now, you may find somebody that modern technology and medicine has kept alive, and they're over there in a corner sitting in a wheelchair, drooling on themselves, and they can't move. Active centenarians are passionate about life. How passionate are they? This is Virgil Kaufman. Virgil was 101 years old, and he rolls into the Chevy dealer in his hometown in Ohio, and he drops $38,000 cash on the table, and he says, I want the new yellow and black Trans Am Camaro. And they think he's got dementia, and they're all laughing at one another, and they say, why do you want it? I said, I want it because it's got the 456 horsepower engine. I want it because it's got this. So they talk to him, and it turns he's out. he's a retired automotive engineer from Detroit. And he says, and I'm going to keep it until I'm 105 years old, and then I'm going to come back and trade it in on a new Corvette. And oh, yes, I want the convertible in the Camaro. And they said, why do you want the convertible? And he said, because the chicks dig it. <laughs> and they sold it to him. And he died at 105 just before he could trade it in. But it was a good 105 years old. Active centenarians never think about age. You ask them, what do you think about being 105? I don't think about it. And that makes sense. <laughs> Because if you think about it, what's 105 look like? What's 80 look like? What's 90 look like? We've got, to, we've got to start seeing these positive images of aging. It's really interesting. People deny their age until they get to a certain point, and then they can't wait to tell it to you. Really. If someone's really old, I never hesitate to ask them how old they are. Because if you don't, they will tell you. They are very, very proud of it. And that's where we've got to be, where it's like, oh, I'm 70 years old. 70 years old is cool. Uh, I can tell you, I know some 70-year-olds that could probably take half of us in this room. This is Harry Bernstein. Harry Bernstein's wife died when he was 93. He was distraught. He didn't want to continue to live. He decided, I'm going to write a book. He wrote a book about uh, growing up in the Jewish ghetto of Manchester, England. Uh, a personal memoir. He sent it to every publisher in New York. Nobody had any interest in it. He sent it to a publisher in the UK. It sat on a, stop, a, t- a stack of scripts for a year. Finally, a, a reader saw it, said to her boss, you've got to read this. And at 96 years old, Harry became a published author for the first time. The book got rave reviews. He wrote two more books before he died uh, at 102. And at 101, he said, quote, My 90s were the most productive years of my life. How often do you hear that? What inspiration is that for all of us in this room? It is never too late. How about the thought that your 90s could be the most productive years of your life? Centenarians, without exception, have a great sense of humor. I think you have to. I mentioned Jean Clement Calme a couple of times. She was asked shortly before her her death, she was 120, and one of her great-great-grandkids said, what's it like to be so old and wrinkly? She said, I have only one wrinkle, and I'm sitting on it. (laughs) We hear those quips all the time from active centenarians. They're very funny people. The common experience of people when they get really old is loss. It's the one thing they all share. And this is a differentiating factor for all of us as we get older. If you live long enough, and and let's hope you do, you're going to lose your keys. You're going to lose your ability to drive. You're going to lose your spouse. You're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your hearing. You're going to lose part of your eyesight. Loss, 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 loss. We are mortal beings. It's part of the deal. Active centenarians somehow have the ability to deal with loss and move on. To mourn and move on and to find a reason to get up next morning. This is Gordy Shields. Gordy had a severe case of bursitis in his back. Started developing when he was 50. By the time he was 80, he could not walk without a cane. He walks like this. He's walking down the street and he sees a guy on a bicycle driving, running by, cranking it out, working out, and he says, you know what? (laughs) That looks like me. Gordy got himself a bike. 
And he became a world champion from 85 on. 85 to 90, 90 to 95, he kicked butt and took names. He was a, he found a way to adapt and, uh, and he continued to ride his bike until he was 95 and became a revered figure in the cycling community. It's, it's the age of liberation, if not now, when? And that is something that people, as they get older, it relates to them. They, it resonates with them. It's something you should use when you approach people, when you talk to people. If not now, when? This is it. We interviewed Dr. Bill Thomas not long ago. Uh, Bill Thomas is a, a renowned geriatric specialist, an MD. He created the Eden Project years ago, which really transformed the way nursing homes take care of people. He built gardens. He brought in animals. Uh, now he's got something called the uh, Age of Disruption Tour. He's reinvented himself as a performance artist. And he goes around. He's been on a 30-city tour where he goes along and he tells stories and he strums his guitar. Uh, and he talks about living dangerously. That's his whole takeaway. Live dangerously. What have you got to lose? The older you get, the more dangerously you should live. This is May Laborde. May was 93 years old. Her husband died. That's, that's, that's a key life event for a lot of people. Her husband died, and she said, you know what, I, I've always wanted to be an actress. Is it too late? She lived in Pasadena. She drove herself to L.A., and she made the rounds talking to agents. She got herself an agent, and she became one of the hottest actresses in, in, in Hollywood. Not really one of the hottest, but she worked regularly. She was on one of the Community Central shows. She was in commercials. Uh, she worked as much as she wanted to up until her death uh, at the age of 103. I think she died. We talked to her when she was 102. She became an actress. She finally realized her dream at the age of 93. We talked about living dangerously. Active older people. This is a nonagenarian. Uh, this is George Blair, Banana George Blair. You've probably heard of him. He's in the Water Skiing Hall of Fame. This is his house behind him. He lives in a yellow house. He drives a yellow car. The flowers in his yard bloom yellow. He wears yellow pajamas. He's got yellow curtains. Seriously, everything in his house is yellow. This is George at the age of 93. Uh, I became friends with George because I did stories on him. And I called him up one day because I hadn't heard from him and said, George, how are you doing? He said, I'm not doing well. I've been in bed for six months with pneumonia, uh, but I'm going to ski one more time. You should come watch. I did. I see history being made because every day uh, Banana George skis is like uh, a new record. It's been a few years since we last hung out with Banana George, the most famous water skier in history. His amazing career has been documented in countless magazines, books, and newspapers worldwide for more than four decades. He's got a worldwide international audience of all age groups, including us, you know, as, as his neighbors. But this past year has been tough on George. He was bedridden with a bad case of pneumonia, and the pain and stiffness from six major back surgeries and a broken neck has slowed him down a good bit, but it hasn't diminished his desire to do what he loves most. And I honestly thought after he had some serious problems over the winter health issues that we had seen the last that he was going to barefoot, but uh, he called me up and said he wanted to go again and I said if you can walk down to the dock, get in your wetsuit and get in this contraption, we're going to pull him in, then we'll pull you skiing. And today with our cameras rolling, George makes it to the boat. Even though I've had every one of his doctors and family members call me and tell me this is not a good idea, I just, you know, I'm going to keep him as safe as I can and, and we're going to take him out there and uh, this is what he lives to do. And so I'm trying to just help him do what he wants to do most. Well, of course I'm worried. <laughs> I'm worried every time he goes out on the water. We're going to be sitting in a contraption like a swing so that if anything does go wrong, I can lift him up out of the water, shut the boat down, and bring him down. The one thing that's real interesting about George, you might not have known, is the guy has drowned twice in his life, and he's terrified of the water, which even makes it more amazing that he wants it to get out this badly. I can't stop him. Nobody can stop him. So, <laughs> Believe me, I tried 10 years ago. <laughs> he's still out there. The boat quickly backs out George in the swing. He only has enough strength for one attempt, and the clock is ticking. 
At age 93, his bare feet are once again on the water, but as his weight is lowered, he spins and tumbles. His good friend Moose is in the water in an instant. A few tense moments later... He's good. You sure you're okay, Georgie? I'm positive. All right. You're an animal, George. That's what we keep telling him. You are an animal. I had his feet on the water, but because he was so light, he didn't have enough control to hold oh, himself George this way. Right. And when he started to spin, his wrists are so sensitive that as soon as he gets spun a little bit, it hurts so badly, he has to let go. Back in the boat, George is disappointed his run didn't last longer, but determined there will be more. It's a world record. <laughs> One, two, three. Back on the shore, George is gently helped off the boat. Believe it or not, the same procedures used when handling nitroglycerin. <laughs> Once inside, he shares a stack of emails from all over the world. You are an inspiration to people young and old. My fourth grade students enjoy learning about your life. I used you as an example of a famous person that has had a positive impact on the life of others. Thank you, George. How do you like that? George gets emotional thinking about his positive impact on others and excited when asked how long he wants to barefoot. <laughs> <laughs> Forever! <laughs> Before we leave, George wants us to see the sign in his kitchen that sums up his philosophy of life, even at age 93. Do it. All of life is up and down. I think uh, I don't wait for the next thing, but I make the next thing happen. Even at 93 and a half, uh, the guy's got drive and passion, and, and uh, he loves the challenge. I'm not growing older, I am growing bolder. How do you like that? Yeah, we liked it a lot when he said that. Uh, but a 93-year-old guy who says, I don't wait for the next thing to happen, I make it happen. Uh, you know, th that's the key to life. George lived until he was 98. Uh, that was the last time he ever skied, and uh, that is in the Guinness Book of World Records, the oldest barefoot skier ever. Uh, so a couple of quick takeaways here. Um, these numbers are phenomenal. Baby boomers will increase annual spending on wellness-based services 500,000%. I, I had to look that up again, from $200 million in 2014 to $1 trillion in 2024. Uh, there's a big piece of that out there waiting for you guys. The question is, what are you going to sell them? And, and here's what we've learned, and this is not rocket science, a lot of people will tell you this. Uh, what you sell them is you sell them the benefits. Baby boomers buy with emotion. You sell them better sex. You sell them independence. You sell them adventure. You sell them more time with their grandkids. You sell them travel. You, you sell them what life can be. And I, I hope you've seen some of what life can be. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Uh, but I know many people that travel the world on a regular basis competing in competitions all over the world. I mean, it's just amazing to see 95-year-olds going everywhere. This is more of the kind of stuff we do. This is Lloyd Kahn over here on the left. He's the founder of the Whole Earth Catalog. I'm looking forward to my 80s and 90s. I've learned to attenuate the effects of aging. These are the kind of messages that people need to hear. You know, the greatest thing, that what I love most about what we do is it resonates with young people as much as it does with older people. We get comments, emails, letters all the time from 20-year-olds that say, you know, I love this stuff because it makes me understand that it is not too late. You know, when we grew up, we had to know who we were going to be or what we were going to be by the time our guidance counselor in high school told us that. Uh, now there's people that are 60, 70, 80 that are starting new businesses, that are reinventing themselves, that are finally taken up something they always wanted to do. On the other photo, the guy on the left is a world record pole vaulter. Uh, uh, 71 years old, Joe Johnston is his name, a really cool guy. The woman on the right is a photographer from the UK who retired, never had taken a photo in her life, but always thought it would be cool, bought a camera, got someone to train her, and for whatever reason, she was inspired by older athletes, so she started taking photos of Masters track and field people. We interviewed her, she came to Orlando, we did a video story on her, and when she was coming, I said, you know, come with me, because I want to introduce you to my friend Joe Johnston. So we took her over to Joe Johnston's pole vaulting barn, and these two, we just got out of the way because they played all day long. Uh, you probably saw this woman recently. This is uh, 
Ida Keeling. Uh, Ida Keeling is 101 years old, and she ran in a special master's race at the Penn Relays about a month ago. Uh, Penn Relays is one of the biggest track and field meets in the world. Um, World-class athletes, they had a special master's, 100 meters, uh, mixed master's, so it was men and women, had to be over 80 to be in it. Ida was 101, and she finished last, but she was in the 101 she was in the uh, 100 to 104 age group, and she set a new world record, uh, 117. When she got done, she dropped down on the ground and did 10 push-ups just to show off. <laughs> the interesting thing about this is two weeks later, a woman named Rita Mae Colber from South Carolina went to the track behind the, the middle school that she used to teach at, and you probably saw this on the news as well, and she lined up to run 100 meters, 100 years old, took about four steps and fell flat on her face. Uh, it was devastating. She got up, her chin is bleeding. They bandaged her chin. Two, mo two minutes later, she's back at the starting line again. Ida went 117 to set the world record. Rita May went 47 seconds. Um, it was not in a sanctioned meet, though, so it doesn't count as a world record, but she's already entered in a sanctioned meet. So suddenly, the hottest division in track and field is the women 100 to 104. Uh, we got to change the narrative. Stereotypes become self-fulfilling prophecies. You know, aging is an opportunity, it's not a disease. Aging is an opportunity, it's not a disease. It's cool to be 60, it's cool to be 70, it's powerful to be 80. Uh, you know, those are the messages, that, that, that's where we've all got to get. Uh, I like to show this because this, this is a sample of a graphic that we put up. Uh, we put up a lot of cool stuff that you've seen, that, you know, great pictures, unbelievable quotes. You know, you get a picture of George Clooney in a swimsuit with his shirt off saying something amazing and people are going to like it. This is just a stupid post-it note. It's nobody's quote. It's note to self. You are not too old. It is not too late. This is the actual metric report in 48 hours from Facebook. This was reached 13 million people. Doesn't mean they saw it, but it was shared and, and got out there. The number that matters is 1, point, 1 million people liked it, commented on or shared. 824,000 people liked this. It was shared 146,000 times. A very simple message. This is what people want to know. This is what you've got to tell your clients. You've got to figure out a way to get out there, and I know you're going to learn that in this session, but you are not too old. It is not too late. And we can show you example after example. I used to think 50 was old, I was wrong, not even close. Harriet Anderson, the oldest woman to ever finish the Iron Man. Start prehabbing. We've got a client who is a world famous neurosurgeon, and this is his mantra. Prehabilitation is more important than rehabilitation. He will not do surgery. He does minimally invasive spinal surgery uh, in, in, in openings that are one-tenth the size that anybody else does, and he gets his patients off the operating table and out of, the, uh, out of the hospital in 45 minutes. It's phenomenal what he does. He will not operate on them until he's had a chance to prehab them. Uh, the better shape you're in before you have some sort of intervention, uh, the, the quicker you will recover and the more extreme your recovery can be. We are all going to encounter health issues. We all have to start prehabbing right now. Prehab for what is to come. Be ready for opportunities that will present themselves. Say yes. I think in that deal it mentions something. I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro with a group of cancer survivors two years ago. Uh, a good friend of mine went with me, uh, Wendy Chioji. She's a three-time cancer survivor, and her mantra is say yes, which is something people who have uh, had cancer or something else learn very quickly. Say yes. Live in the moment. I said yes. I was, by 10 years, the oldest person on that climb, and I didn't have a chance to train for it. But we came together, a group of 16 strangers, and the guy who, who led us up the mountain is one of only nine Americans to summit both Everest and K2, and he came together and said, all of your fancy $300 boots and $200 shoes or $200 jackets, none of that is going to get you to the top of the mountain. Uh, there is no such thing as individual load, and there's no such thing as individual resource. I will take the pack off of your back and put it on his back if I don't think you can carry it, and he can. I will take the food out of your mouth and put it in her mouth if I think she needs it more than you do. There is only one thing that will get us to the summit together, all 16 of us, and that is love. And you will learn to love one another as you go up that mountain. And son of a gun, by the time we got to the top of the mountain, 
uh, we were in love with one another. We all made it at the same time, which is nearly impossible because people climb at different speeds. They typically break up into smaller groups, but the experience of being in that situation with these people, I now have lifelong friends that I communicate with on a weekly basis. Get involved in this kind of stuff. Form groups, do something together. There is no single thing that leads to successful aging. And I'm gonna prove it to you. This is Gene Calmet again. Dipping back into the Gene file one more time. Uh, you see the picture of Gene with her lovely great-granddaughters. The oldest living human being ever. Active longevity is the sum total of everything that you do. Don't fret about not doing any one particular thing because this is Jean five minutes after her grandkids left. <laughs> she liked to smoke a cigarette and she lived to 122. This is the Growing Boulder Manifesto. This is 70, 80, 90, 100, 107, and 109. You gotta work. You have to work your mind. Your mind is an instrument. You gotta oil and grease it. This is not what we've been led to believe. The stereotypes of ageism embedded in our psyche make us fear what can be the best days of our lives. We've been programmed to give up brainwashed into believing that when our skin begins to wrinkle, our dreams begin to die. <laughs> Remember when we thought the future was filled with limitless possibility, when there was time to do anything? There still is. It's never too late. Dreams don't have an expiration date. There's still time to learn a new instrument, to pick up a paintbrush, to start a new business, to get back into shape, or even get into shape for the first time. Anything is possible. Dreams are not about age, they're about attitude. Stop growing older and start growing bolder. With few exceptions, Madison Avenue, the mainstream media, and Hollywood all underestimate our passion and our potential. They don't respect our dreams, our desires, or even our money. Ageism, like racism and sexism, is rooted in fear and ignorance, and it threatens the future of every one of us, including our children and grandchildren, because age is a fate that only the unfortunate escape. Refuse to accept the negative stereotypes of aging. If your mind believes them, so will your body. Stop growing older and start growing bolder. Are you unhappy with who you are, with where you are in life? Do you long for more? Then go find it. Quit waiting for life to find you and quit waiting for permission to find it. Get off the couch and get into life. Happiness is not about age, it's about attitude. Stop growing older and start growing bolder. Be optimistic about your future and take a leap of faith. Pursue your passions, find your purpose, and don't say you don't have one, you just haven't found it yet. Probably because you stopped looking. Finding passion and purpose is not about age, it's about attitude. Stop growing older and start growing bolder. And don't quit when you fail because you probably will. At least at first, everyone does. To be afraid to fail is to be afraid to live. The question is, how many times are you willing to fail before you succeed? Success is not about age, it's about attitude. Stop growing older and start growing bolder. Move forward, but give back. Help others any way you can. A simple act of kindness can change someone's day or maybe even their life. Making a difference is not about age, it's about attitude. Stop growing older and start growing bolder. Refuse to believe that it's too late for anything. Dreams don't have an expiration date. Believe that the rest of your life can be the best of your life. The most powerful weapon in the war against ageism is the simple example of an ordinary person living an extraordinary life. You can be that person. Stop growing older and start growing bolder.
Thank you. Uh, I'm out of time. I, I very much enjoyed this, and, and I just leave you with this. Don't let circumstance, don't let the media, don't let anybody squeeze life out of you. You know, refuse to give in. Continue to live. And, and I think Dylan Thomas said it best. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. So rage on, everybody.